happen with these Regieleckis, but unfortunately not going to be seeing any coming out on one side of the field. But then, again, still no Regieleckis. They might be in the back though, Lee, as well with that Galerian Moltres. We'll have to find out. But it's going to be the Urshifu and the Glastria there for um, Binjay and for Jean-Paul Lopez. We have got the Amoongus and the Incineroar. So Jean-Paul leading out with two very disruptive Pokemon. We've got an Intimidate user there that's going to be very beneficial for him against both these physical attackers. Having access to Fake Out as well can cause a bit of disruption in Amoongus, of course. We all know that it can Rage Powder moves away and also put Pokemon to sleep with Spore. Yeah, that sleep threat there straight away from Jean-Paul, especially with the fake out support, is quite something that makes Benji have to think about what he does in this turn. Um, as we're getting straight into it, both players not hanging around, Lou. No, the fake out going straight down into that Urshifu and Amoongus. We don't often see it moving before another Pokemon, but you know, the speed of that Glastri is so, so slow. It's able to get the edge on it and go for that spore into the Urshifu, putting it to sleep. But the Glastri are able to survive, you know, being targeted by either of these Pokemon, going for that Swords Dance. Again, not something we commonly see on the Glastria, but it does have to be careful if that Amoongus is able to outspeed it. It could very well be the next Pokemon to go to sleep. This is the problem here, you know, the, the Amoongus has already been shown to be faster than it and with the, the Urshifu out of action here from that combination of Fake Out and Spall, not really able to do anything. So you may think that Binji needs to kind of reposition his board, maybe get something like the Clefairy on the field uh, to try and support the Glastria before it is put to sleep by that Amoongus. Well, Jean-Paul really targeting down the Urshifu, going for the parting shot into it as well to lower its attack. And while it's sleeping as well, obviously this is going to be... Um... Um, you know, unable to move at this occasion and Moltres is going to be able to come in. It's just preserving the Pokemon on John Paul's side that little bit more. Amoongus is, of course, going to outspeed that Glastria, going to be putting it to sleep as well. So Benji's Pokemon having a bit of a slow start to this game one, but what a reveal oh. is this? It's going to be the berry. Um, I think it's the Lumberry there waking it up. It's going for <laughs> another sword stance. This Moltres and the wow. Amoongus must be terrified of the ice type moves, Lee. That's plus four that the Glastria is on there now. Ooh. You know, Binji had a great opportunity knowing that he had that Lumberry there to really take advantage of that turn and maybe go for the knockout onto the Amoongus with one of those ice type attacks that we commonly see on Glastria and what it's known for. But uh, opting to go for another sword stance here, get set up even further and become an even bigger threat. No player either at this point going for their Dynamax. So that's still in the bag for both sides of the field. And you can think right now that Binji is trying to, to set this Glastria up to get and be that Dynamax. Pokemon for him. Uh, Jean-Paul, on the other hand, has got the Moltres on the field, has got the opportunity to start doing some good damage to things like Urshifu now with the Max Airstreams and also, you know, with the redirection support from the Amoongus in a position now where it's able to stop maybe just redirecting that uh, damage from the Glastria and doing some good damage in return to the, the Glastria and stop wearing that down because of the threat that it is after those sword stances. Yeah, and the thing is as well, the Glastria has eaten its berry now. It's not going to be able to survive another one of those spores. Um, it's going to have to go to sleep if it connects in. But the Urshifu is able to wake up and go for that wicked blow. Tuck me down into the Amoongus. Does a huge amount of damage, obviously, with that critical hit from Wicked Blow, but not enough to pick up the KO as Moltres can fire off a Max Airstream in retaliation. Going to be able to get the solid KO there against the Urshifu and remove it from the field. Poor Urshifu is certainly having a very hard time in this match, constantly being targeted down by John Paul's Pokemon. And Moltres gives John Paul's side of the field a boost of speed as well. The Glastria is going to be put to sleep by that Amoongus as well. Particularly now it is that little bit speedier with plus one speed. Um, but the thing is, while the Glastria is able to stay on the field, it can always wake up and go for a very, very powerful plus four boosted move. Yeah, that's the thing. And now you, you, you can't really ignore it, even though it is asleep. I think it's time to really kind of make that your, your priority here going forward. Make sure you can get as much damage onto it now while it's not Dynamaxed as possible because once it does Dynamax, it obviously gets a bit more of a defensive bulk and, and it is a lot harder to take down. We do see the Regieleki hit the field now, um, which is going to threaten the Moltres on Jean-Paul's side of the field, especially if that is mm. the option that, you know, <laughs> Binji has the option here to Dynamax it if he wants to. But the thing is, the redirection still on play from the Amoongus. I think the first thing that you want to do if you are Binji is get rid of that redirection, get rid of that spore threat from the Amoongus. Um, once that's gone, things kind of get a little bit simpler, but it's it's all in hope that you can get your Glastria through these turns before it wakes up and then really utilize the sword sense that you've invested earlier on in this game. That's the thing, Amoongus doesn't usually mind coming down against an electric type Pokemon, but at such low HP, it's good to be able to bring it back into its Pokeball, activate its regenerator ability so it can come back onto the battlefield with a little bit more HP and provide that crucial support later on in the game. Binjay, however, is indeed going to go for that Dynamax. Um, we're going to be, I think, getting the Glastria up into 
nice Dynamax form. And, you know, this is the interesting thing as well about having that plus four. Because one thing, if you're Binger, you've got to be worried about when going down against the Galarian Moltres is activ accidentally activating that weakness policy and the Berserk ability. But if you can pick up a solid one-hit KO, even in Dynamax form by being plus four, that could be a very set strategy for you to go for. Incineroar having to take a good chunk of damage from this Regioletti. But Moltres able to fire off a max airstream in retaliation. Going to go into that. Glastria, though, however, is going to take it very well, especially in its Dynamax form. But the speed, once again, being set up on John, Paul, John Paul's side of the field. And Cinderella going to be able to get that speed boost as well, having joined the action. Yeah, and the, the Intimidate really useful onto the Glastria, putting it down to only just plus three now, Lou. Um, <laughs> or plus two, sorry, because of the initial... Uh, intimidate that we saw there so mm. but still a huge threat and i think the big thing here is that the moltres without that weakness policy boost it's just not getting the damage that it needs onto the glastria binji making the right call there dynamax in the glastria and making sure that whatever damage is going to take through these sleep turns is really minimal yeah, the Moltres here now going to go for that Max Darkness into the Glastria. Going to just do a little bit more chip damage, but reduce the special defense of both of Binjay's Pokemon. And, you know, really good spot there as well, Lee, with those two Indemnidates. I completely forgot about those. It's now only at plus two, but still, that's going to be formidable if you can connect into that Moltres. But Regieleki is going to do the dangerous thing. You know, does a big amount of damage, but is going to be able to activate that weakness policy and the Berserk ability as well, as the Electro-type move did just over 50% damage. Instant Raw, however, going to target down into that Glastria with another parting shot. So this Incineroar being really critical on the field at the moment. You know, Jean-Paul knows he needs to utilize it for that Intimidate ability to apply pressure to that Glastria, you know, reducing those Sword Stamp boosts and also being able to apply pressure with the Fire-type moves later on in the game. And you want to maybe utilize that when Glastria is not in this Dynamax form and has less HP to contend with. It also allows him to bring in this Landorus and fire off another Intimidate. I believe putting Glastria now at only plus one. It might be down to just neutral now after the parting shot there that we just saw into the, the Glastria. So it does actually wake up, um, but going to be more than enough probably to pick up the knockout still onto this Moltres. Um, and then it's going to get that chilling nair boost, which we've already seen in previous games featuring the Glastria, how powerful this ability can be. And now the snowball really starts, especially with the, uh, the Moltres gone and off the field after those boosters just mm. received as well, really not being able to take advantage of that. So a really critical time for the Glastria to wake up and be able to remove a threat like that from the field. Yeah, Binjay's going to breathe a sigh of relief there, uh, making sure that the Moltres, like you said, with all of those boosts, has been removed and now can continue to apply pressure to this Landorus. You know, Regieleki isn't going to be able to do much against it being an electric type and predominantly only has access to these electric type moves, but having ice type moves on that Glastria is certainly going to come in handy against both an Amoongus and a Landorus. So um, it's going to be interesting to see, obviously, who the Glastria is going to be able to target down. Amoongus could go for that redirection here as well, just to protect that Landorus a little bit. Yeah, maybe if you are binge, you sacrifice your Regieleki if it has got something like um, the Electro Web, just to slow down that Amoongus to make sure that you are able to outspeed it and pick up the knockout the next turn. Uh, whether he's got the Electro Web or not is another thing, because that would be an option for him to avoid any spore threat going forward. Amunga is able to hang on, though, from the damage taken by the Regieleki as Landorus decides to go for a sword stance <laughs> of its very own here. So lots of sword stance shenanigans going on across both sides of the field. Um, Amunga is going to go down into the Glastria, but it is going to be able to protect itself. I believe that was a spore coming out, which would make a lot of sense. You want to put that Glastria right back to sleep and protect both these Pokemon from any of those Ice-type moves. Yeah, and now the problem lies that the uh, Regieleki's already got that initial damage off onto the Amoongus to put it in range for a Thunderbolt now, which protects it from uh, the, the Glacier from being put to sleep. But at the same time, the Lander is really taking advantage of this brilliant board position that Jean-Paul set up and getting a sword stance of his own up now without any kind of hindrance of an Intimidate from the other side of the field from Binji's end. And uh, in a position to potentially just Earthquake here, you know the Amoongus has to be targeted from the Regieleki to prevent the sleep. So you can just Earthquake quick and probably take both targets on Binji's side of the field down. Well, just going to be protect there from the Regieleki. Doesn't want to take any damage from this Landorus. Um, Amoongus as well going to be protecting in case something like an Earthquake is going to come out from the Landorus. Going to connect onto um, both of those protects. So indeed, going to be... Um, you know, going for a big same type of tap bonus move here. Going to target down into that Glastria. And it is enough to pick up the KO. So, John Paul able to protect himself um, from taking any more damage from that Glastria. That threat has now been removed from the field. And it's, you know, had quite a formidable run, that Glastria here at the moment. You know, coming out in that sort of turn one, getting up both those Swords Dance boosts. It certainly had a lot to play with. Amoongus able to hang on as well with the hail. 
Yeah, and just showing really Amungus how useful it's been in this match for Jean-Paul to really um, disrupt uh, Binji's kind of offensive strategy here, you know, with the spore and then the intertwining uh, intimidates that we've seen between the Landorus and the Incineroar, and then to pull out the sword stance right there with the Landorus and put himself in an absolutely amazing position now where he can probably just rock slide and be enough to get the Reggie Alecki at this point. He's still got the redirection to pull in any threatening attacks as well on his Amungus, and he's also got the option to potentially switch that Amungus out if he wants now, uh, get that regenerator activated again and get Incineroar back on the field with access to that fake out. Well, Amoongus just going to go for a Rage Powder here. No longer has a speed advantage upon any of the Pokemon, so just wants to protect that Landorus going forward. And it will be KO'd from the Reggie Alecki there. Reggie Alecki's been trying to get that KO all game and finally manages to accomplish it. Landorus going to go for a Rock Slide, going to connect on both the opposing Pokemon. And wow. then HP bars shot <laughs> right down. Picks up a very solid double KO there, Lee. Wow, go Landorus. Wow, yeah, just showing why it is that number one used Pokemon in this tournament so far, Lou. Yeah, really making a big impact here. And that Sword Sands play was huge from Jean-Paul. You're not like, you really not... <laughs> Commonly, an, an option seen on it, you know, was generally seen in a salt vest used um, to make sure that its longevity mm -hmm. is 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 maximized, so it can take and make use of those Dynamax turns when you decide to go for that. But the other option is obviously going for that sword stance and making it a big threat immediately. And uh, Jean Paul showing there that he was able, in, even in front of something that Landorus never really likes to be in front of the Glastria setting up, um, just with the support options that he had next to it, with that Amoongus, with the Incinerate, and really making use of those. Pokemon to the best potential, making it very difficult for Binji to kind of get any sort of grip on that match. Yeah, I mean, there was certainly a lot of action going on. We saw, you know, some sleep turns going down with that Amoongus as well. So many stat statistic changes as well. Like, I'm so glad you're here casting with me, Lee, because I was having a nightmare <laughs> tracking those attack stats. So thank you so much for keeping me in check. I'll try oh, and avoid so, looking. Just, yeah. <laughs> like, I think I originally forgot there. about it as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least at least one of us was, you know, staying nice and focused. I'll blame Reggie Lecky. It was so cute. I was looking at it bouncing around. And, you know, Reggie Lecky still did a lot of really good work, but it was no feat for that Landorus towards the end. You know, Landorus coming in, going for that Earthquake as well, going for the big damage onto that mm. Glastria. But critically, the Rock Slide being able to connect. Um, and, you know, had to go for that Rock Slide um, with the... Rotom on the field, you know, I mean, for those ground type moves, uh, but able to connect and pick up such a strong KO at the end of the game. And there were so many sort of tossing and turnings in that match about who had the biggest stats. And I think the way that Jean Paul played, being able to constantly threaten the attack of that Glastria, just stopped Binje from being able to set it up the way he wants to start steamrolling through a team, particularly when it's Dynamax as well. It can only go for single type attacks. And that can sometimes be a little bit limiting if you've got a Pokemon like the Amoongus going for that redirection, Pokemon like the Incineroar coming in, going for fake out as well. Yeah, and I think the one thing that was really highlighted here was the the, the fact that the, there was no speed control support for that Glastria on uh, and Binji's side of the, of the field, you know, really relies heavily, like we've seen in previous games, that it relies so heavily on that Trick Room to, to allow it to function the way it wants. And without that, that speed control there, it's really prone to spores like we saw there. Mm -hmm. it's, in pro it's prone to parting shots that Jean-Paul used so well in that match to just make sure and mitigate almost all of the the sword stance attack boosts that he got in the end you know um and just made it very difficult to get really much out of it bringing in we'll see the moltres as well and making a nice appearance mm -hmm. there and doing the, the initial work that it needed to to kind of clear the path for the landers then to come in <laughs> get that sword stance up of its own and without the threat of intimidate from the opposite side of the field there was nothing to really mitigate that and that's where reggie Alecki obviously struggles against the ground type as well well, let's jump into game two and see what Pokemon action will occur. Whether the Landorus will be, you know, still hyped up from that amazing end to game one and be able to do some destruction on the battlefield. But it's going to be the same leads coming out here for Jean-Paul with the Amoongus and the Incineroar. And I believe it is the same as well for Binjay with that Urshifu and the Glastria. Both of them going to be taking this Intimidate. So Incineroar well placed to apply its ability at a critical position here. And, you know, last time we saw the Amoongus really sort of playing around um, the fact that it could outspeed that Glastria and start putting a few Few things to sleep yeah and that is the problem i think the 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 um the amoogas being able to outspeed the um the the glastria and uh, able to take that critical hit wicked blow which is the other thing how well it's been trained makes it so difficult to deal with here and it's just the the, the constant threat that you've got from that spore um it does leave the the glastria a little bit of room to maybe start getting damage off this time rather than concentrating down on those sword stances like we saw in the previous game 
Well, possibly, but not to be. The Glastria wants to make sure that it at least has a neutral or positive um, attack stat here, putting itself up to plus one. Maybe it won't see that second one come into effect. Um, we already know that it's got that Lumberry on there, so if Amoongus wants to target it down with another Spore, instead of just putting it in that same position the next turn, this could be the opportunity for that Glastria to go for some big damage, knowing that it can survive one Spore and wake up. Yeah, it's still, like you say, Lou, it's, it's really, like, critical that, that he takes advantage of that Lumberry because he didn't really take advantage of it in that first game. We saw him go for a second sword stance, and that was the turn when maybe you think, okay, if you'd max there, maybe gone for the max hailstorm, you can remove the Amoongus from the field, and then that threat, that redirection support, the spore support that has been such a hindrance to you is removed from the field, and um, you're able as well if you can pick the knockup out you're going to be able to access those chilling nays and uh, it becomes a lot harder of a job for something like landris to come on the field at that point as well I really like the adjustment by Binji as well, bringing the Clefairy here into the action. Incineroar going to be able to target down both these opposing Pokemon here as Amoongus goes for a Spore, but we know that the Glastria is going to be able to wake up. And this is why I love the Clefairy switching in here. It's going to be able to have that Friend Guard ability to provide that support and then can redirect away the Spore on the next turn, leaving Glastria free to get off two max moves guaranteed. It goes for the Dreamite Hellstorm into that Incineroar, so not going to be able to deal super effective damage by any means, but sets up the Hail, gets that little bit of residual chip and also could have potentially caught the landerous potentially switching in at this stage um i think it was it potentially a burning jealousy from that incineral um, i'm not 100 percent sure lou with that one but yeah i think you're very right with trying to catch the landerous switch in there predict predicting maybe a potential parting shot coming out from the um the incineral there and repositioning with the landerous to get that double intimidate onto the board but i feel again that you're missing the opportunity to really get rid of one of the big threatening pokemon in amoongus here because that is the threat that is the thing that's going to start putting your team in a very awkward position and putting it to sleep so being able to get the clefarian is very useful for binji can kind of dodge that that spore this next turn <coughs> and he's going to be able to um utilize that and try and take it down maybe this this turn coming up well clefairy doing what it does best and going for that follow me incineral gonna get in on out of there though going for that parting shot and you know clefairy such a great partner pokemon to have here as a supporting role it doesn't mind taking these parting shots it is not known as a you know predominantly physical attacker it's there for all of the support that it needs to have so taking that away so that the glastria can remain protected um and not have to take that parting shot is going to be critical the lander is however going to be able to jump in and have something to say about that attack stat with the intimidate and i believe it's bringing it right back down to neutral but i'm sure leo correct me if i am wrong um it's going to be a spore coming out though from the amoongus targeting down the clefairy so the glastria no longer has the utility to be able to redirect moves away but it is able to go for that ice type move once again this time catching the landerus on the switch in um and will be able to remove it from play but yes landerus is gone but that amoongus is still there it can easily go for spore on this next turn particularly as chilling nay has activated the glastria i believe is now at plus one then that's going to be something that jean paul really wants to target down with that spore yeah i think that's the priority going into this next turn and now being able to kind of put the clefairy to sleep this is the the, the thing from the previous turn it's the, yeah you can put the clefairy to sleep but you really want to be taking the opportunity to put the glastria like the glastria needs to be taking the opportunity to get rid of the amoongus while it can yeah all very nice getting rid of the landerus whilst you can but you know the the the, the disruptive pokemon on the opposite side of the field for binji is that amoongus and you've got to be scared of potentially a protect or a switch out there so you can understand why he's going into the slot that he's been dedicating these uh, max hailstorms over and over again but the problem is now that the spore threat is still on the field and it's it's a big threat now to shut down the, the the glastria and really mitigate any uh, advantage that he's got at this present time well, Binjo making up a switch, takes Clefairy off the field while allowing the Glastria to max guard as well. Just going to stop any spores from occurring here. Moltres capitalizes on this though and goes for that nasty plot. So going to boost up its special attack by two stages and make itself incredibly formidable here. Of course, Jean-Paul still has access to his Dynamax as well and I wouldn't be surprised to see his Pokemon of choice being that Galarian Moltres later on in this game. Yeah, that's the thing. Like the, 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 the Galarian Moltres did so much work in game one for him. It was such a good utility for him here. Uh, it wouldn't be any surprise for it to see him use it again now. And uh, the Amoogus on the field now is a little bit threatened. You know, Benji's made a really good play of getting the, the Rotom Heat onto the field. Now, that does threaten the, the knockout onto Amoongus here. Uh, and it does make Jean-Paul have to think twice about going for that Spore into the Glastria slot in case of a knockout. Uh, the other thing he needs to consider as well as a potential nasty plot play here from Benji uh, 
We've seen how much he relies on these setup moves, so it's not something you can really underestimate going into this next turn. Yeah, I like this turn here by Binji, you know, trying to maybe waste one of the turns of Amoongus going for that spore into the glass tree, which looks, you know, such a prime opportunity for John Paul to capitalize on. Bringing in the Clefairy that's already asleep, you know, it doesn't mind taking that, allowing the Rotom to maybe try and target down, either remove the Rotom from play or try and do some damage to this Moltres. But the fact that it's in his Dynamax with the HP stat as well, you don't want to be activating that weakness policy too. Moltres is going to go for that Max Darkness, however, going to connect down onto the Rotom. Not going to be able to pick up the KO, though, able to survive on 14 HP, but it's certainly at a really precarious situation. We've got to remember as well, the hail is on the field too. Thankfully though, Rotom does have a little citrus berry to snack on, be able to regain some HP here, you know, putting itself out of that hail range. Um, as it goes for the overheat, going to target down into the Amoongus. Is it enough to remove it from play? Yes, it is. So Minji now doesn't have to worry about the Amoongus putting that glass year to sleep upon its re-entry to the game later on. Yeah, and you can see how useful that Friend Guard ability is from the Clefairy here. Even though the Clefairy is still asleep, its Friend Guard ability is still active when it was brought onto the field. And just enough to allow the Rotom there to be able to survive that Max Darkness and allow the ability to take down the Amoongus. Finally, that threat <laughs> from Jean-Paul's side of the field is removed. But the next thing that Benji has to worry about is obviously trying to get through these next few Dynamax turns with his Rotom and Clefairy that are still sitting on the field. And Clefairy not in the greatest position, still asleep at the moment. Yeah, if you're Binge, you really do need that Clefairy to wake up. And again, I think it's a really good mention there by Yuli about having that friend guard ability because Binge, you could have kept the glass rear on and, you know, tried to pick up the KO against that Amoongus with the overheat, but Rotom would never have been able to survive that Max Darkness with that Clefairy by its side. So a really great switch by Binge, but he needs that Clefairy to go one step further and wake up. Rotom, however, is going to retreat, wants to get its stats reset from the drops, and Urshifu will rejoin the field. So Urshifu and Clefairy both sleeping. Clefairy is indeed going to stay asleep leaving Incineroar able to go for that fake out. So Urshifu just going to be able to take that. Moltres, however, going to be the powerhouse here, going for that max airstream, goes into the Clefairy and absolutely removes it from play. And this is where things get really scary for Binjay because the speed is now going to be increasing up on John Paul's side of the field as well. That Moltres is just going to be able to do so much damage. You know, the Urshifu isn't going to be able to dodge out of the way of one of those max airstreams. No, and unfortunately, the thing is as well with the, the speed boost, it's boosting the speed on the Incineroar here. Now, the Urshifu is asleep, so it's not really going to be able to function very well. And if they, we do see the Glastria come back onto the field, the double up from the Moltres and the Incineroar is an easy target, you know, into that Glastria to make sure you remove that final threat from the field. And then from there, you can pretty much wrap things up with Moltres. He's put himself in a great position in this end game, making it very difficult for Benji. But Benji has got the offensive options to really really damage this this Moltres and Incineroar if he can get through the sleep turn with in, uh, Urshifu and he can maybe protect this Glastri for just one more turn. That's the thing, if you're able to take out the Moltres, it puts you in a really phenomenal position here. And you know, Rotom, if potentially he's able to get some kind of nasty plot boost up, then can deal some good damage outside of the Dynamax, that could be the way to try and get through it. But I don't think John Paul's going to give him the opportunity to be able to do that, going for another Max Darkness here. Going down, taking it down to 20 HP on that Glastria. It is going to be able to survive, but I'm sure it's not going to be around for long, particularly if that Incineroar has something to say about it. Urshifu as well, still sleeping, not going to be able to deal any damage to that opposing Incineroar or the Moltres. And it looks like the Burning Jealousy coming out here and picking up the KO against the Glastria. So removes it from play and does some damage to that Urshifu as well. But as long as Urshifu is sleeping, that Moltres is going to be so formidable to deal with. Yeah, and, and a really good, you know, move there to make sure that you, you the option of burning jealousy, you know, you mentioned it earlier, Lou, and I think that just having that, that, that spread damage to make sure that you're not having to really dedicate it to one slot covers both Pokemon with uh, with decent damage and doing enough to get rid of the Glastria and really Moltres return here from when it's Dynamax and utilizing those three turns has been phenomenal in an incredible position now to take down either the, the Rotom or the Urshifu if it chooses to but it could just go for that Fury Wrath and just take down the Rotom make sure to get rid of that and then utilize Incineroar to deal with the Urshifu that's left still sleeping on the field. <laughs> exactly. Moltres, however, going to fall into the protect there of the um, Rotom, but the Urshifu not going to be able to dodge out of the way. The Fiery Wrath is going to be able to survive those and not being super effective. It's going to be the Dark-type move coming out. No um, Flying-type moves. And 
finally being wow. able to wake up, going for that close combat into the Moltres. Uh, that's something Binjo really wants to be able to see. Moltres has now left the field, but there is still this Incineroar to contend with. The Rotom, however, of course, protecting, going to save itself from any burning jealousy damage. The Urshifu, not so lucky, oh. and it will be KO'd. So close there. The, 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 the game felt like it just swung in a huge direction there when the Moltres got picked up from the, the Urshifu. The wake up there was massive. Now, can the, the Rotom pick up the knockout on Incineroar? This is the big thing. If you can pick up the knockout onto it, it's going to be, uh, 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 you know, you're going to take this game, tie it up if you're bingy. But uh, the, the thing is with Incineroar, it's so defensively bulky. You know, it's built so well. It's going to be difficult for... Uh, Benji to take it down and with such low health does the Incineroar have an option like Darkest Lariat to maybe take advantage of here and that's exactly what you're going to be needing. I mean, if you're the Rotom now, the question is, to Nasty Plot or not? The Incineroar is moving first, takes it down to 14 HP. Um, and, you know, just I'm so unfortunately there for the Rotom. It is indeed going for that Nasty Plot, but I think another move coming out from that Incineroar is going to be able to pick up the KO. You know, Nasty Plot boosts your special attack, not your speed. And that's really what the Rotom needed on this occasion. I'm sure it has um, sort of the, the strength to be able to pick up a KO at this stage. But just if it's not going to be able to go first, we're never going to be able to see it. The Snarl coming out again from the Incineroar. Going to be able to pick up the KO here. Um, meaning Jean-Paul is going to be able to advance. I mean, what an 